Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall. And I'm Laura Sol. And Laura, who are you talking to today? So I'm talking to Boldra Siksik Minjin, who is uh, known by her friends in the US as Bolor. And she is a paleontologist from Mongolia, who is now actually based at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. She was highly influential in the retrieval of um, Mongolian fossils, particularly dinosaurs from foreign traffickers. Maybe people have heard of Tarbosaurus batar. Uh, and actually also founded and is now the director of the Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs in our home country. So she um, has a lot of titles under her belt. And we've also got Tia Boudou, who's a communications professional uh, who's interested in science outreach. And she's been working with Blur on a crowdfunding campaign, which you're going to hear a lot about in this episode. So this crowdfunding campaign is really to raise money for this huge outreach and conservation project that they have going on last summer, this summer, over in Mongolia. Um, The details will all be on the PaleoCast website. The crowdfunding campaign is on Indiegogo and I believe is called Save Mongolia's Dinosaurs and I think is launching on the 27th of June. So this is quite a long episode, so we split it into two halves. In the first half, we concentrate more on the paleontological heritage of Mongolia. And in the second half, we concentrate more on their scientific outreach program. And as always, make sure you go to our website where you can see loads of pictures of them doing their work and the landscape and scenery in Mongolia, as well as find all the links for all the different websites that we mentioned in the episode, as well as the crowdfunding campaign. Thanks for listening. We hope that you enjoy this episode. Hi, Balor. Welcome to PaleoCast. Oh, hi, uh, Laura. Thank you very much. Um, so just to begin with, some of your, your background as a paleontologist, you're one of very few Mongolian paleontologists, particularly vertebrate paleontologists. Can you tell us really what inspired you to carry on in, prof- in a profession that's so unusual in Mongolia? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, well, um, in terms of paleontology and becoming paleontologist is not really easy uh, in Mongolia. The uh, reason I would say that is even though Mongolia has been known um, by um, quite rich, uh, rich fossil records, um, people who study are very few. Um, so in terms of my experience, uh, how I interested into paleontology is to do with my father, um, who is uh, who was uh, one of the um, first generation of Mongolian paleontologists uh, who were trained in Soviet Union back in 1960s. So, right, so you I, were following in his footsteps in a way. Yes. Um, and so, um, so of course, I exposed a quite young age to paleontology because of my father, but wasn't the case for most of kids in Mongolia and even not, you know, publicly uh, profession is not commonly been known um, uh, back then. And of course we had um, some dinosaur fossils been displayed in Natural History Museum. You know, that's the first thing how Mongolian kids been exposed to paleontology. Then once you, you know, leave the, uh, you know, museum, there's not uh, basically no source of information that you can learn more about these, you know, uh, exciting, interesting animals. Right. Um, so for me, um, I, you know, I visited my father's uh, university. It's a, um, a, a Mongolian University of Science and Technology. He he he's, he was uh, he had been teaching there forty years. So. Um, so I visited his classroom. His classroom was um, they have uh, you know posters and models of you know uh, mammoths, uh, 
you know, like brunt of bears or this kind of, yeah. you know, really unusual looking animals yeah. being displayed in his classroom. And also there were fossils around. So when I visited his uh, cabinets, I mean, the classroom was very interesting for me. And then, um, you know, when I was uh, small, my father used to show a slideshow of dinosaur um, images for my birthday. So my friends, you know, through that, my friends been exposed to dinosaurs uh, through, you know, my birthday. But then I wasn't really got into uh, paleontology till really in uh, college. So okay. when I started uh, my college and I, uh, I chose the um, geology as my major and then um, my father was teaching a paleontology in in that university. And um, so I was taking his class uh, uh, while I was doing my undergraduate, um, his, his paleontology class. And uh, so that was really my, um, uh, you know, um, getting into a more professional level and in terms of knowledge, much deeper, deeper to know about paleontology. And, you know, after my undergraduate, um, I, um, uh, you know, pursued to do my master's in paleontology, but, you know, there's not many people to go around to ask to be my advisor. Yeah. So my father was my actually, you know, master's degree advisor. So, okay. so my father was really kind of, you know, holding my hands you know, going through all this, um, you know, giving the knowledge about this uh, field of science for me. So, um, but it wasn't easy. But my interest was, you know, because his um, research interest was on uh, fossil corals. Um, but I was interested in, um, in vertebrate paleontology, you know. So, but some way my father was saying, say to me that, oh, it's a hard to go to vertebrae because you have to know anatomy and then we need to have a fossil. So some way I was discouraged to go to that way. Mm -hmm. And so it was very limited uh, source of information and for me to learn about more vertebrate um, groups. So I actually um, really wanted, then I basically started telling my father, I went to um, veterinary school uh, asked one of the teachers who were teaching anatomy to teach me uh, anatomy. So um, that really um, you know, helped me to um, get to know about this field. And then, of course, um, in 90s, 1990s, beginning of 1990s, American Museum of Natural History went back to Mongolia. Mm -hmm. They were doing um, um, expeditions in searching for dinosaurs and fossils. Um, uh, mammals. So, so I was, um, I had opportunity to go to that, um, expedition only if I do a cook. <laughs> so, right. I mean, that was okay. uh, from, you know, one of our, the Mongolian leader, um, and he basically said, my Actually, my dad was invited to go to that expedition to do a um, to geology map of Ukatal, but, um That's a Lake Cretaceous locality. That's where the nesting of raptors been found. So my mm -hmm. father basically asked the, the leader, Mongolian leader of that expedition, if he can bring me to the expedition because I'm a, uh, during that time I was uh, trained. Um, for my master's to be a paleontologist, uh, so he basically said if she if she do if she did the cook, then she can join the expedition. So um, it was very disappointing for me that I wasn't really being seen as uh, you know one of those uh, paleontologists. Instead, I'm you know kind of <laughs> I don't cook well, so um, right. so. Um, so that's how I started to joining uh, Amer uh, the expedition, Americanism of Natural History. But the, doing the cook is for Mongolians, not for Americans. Americans were doing their own cooking. So, um, so that's how I started to going really to um, 
vertebrate paleontology field started with that expedition, learning about, you know, um, uh, vertebrates and the geology of that time period for, you know, for Cretaceous. So it was pretty... So when you were on that expedition, you did, in, even though you went as the cook, you did end up kind of being able to learn and get involved with the actual paleontology as well. Well, um, you know, I've been, I've been asked, you know, I had been asked to do the cook, but I've, I've been very stubborn um, and, and basically saying, no, I'm a paleontologist. You know, I'm supposed to be doing what is all the paleontologists been doing in the expedition. So I had some arguments with the, um, you know, leader, Mongolian yeah. leader, at some point, and he basically refused me to bring for the next expedition the following season. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but I didn't really, you know, I basically said, well, I, this is the experience I really want to get. So I, I never, basically, I didn't end up doing cook. I keep following. Um, you know, other paleontologists, you know, prospecting, looking for fossils. Um, so I've been, you know, scolded that I'm not cooking. And so, but, you know, I think for me, I stand on my ground that I really do. If I were ended up, uh, did the cook, I probably wouldn't have a chance and experience that I could have got. So, yeah. um, so that those experience in the field were very, um, for me, it's like life changing and I really wanted to do more. Um, so then, um, you know, the, the, the paleontologists from American Museum of Natural History, they were asking if I would be interested, pursue my paleontology in PhD in, in the U.S. I, of course, I say yes. And so... So then, since then, I worked in that expedition um, for six years. So every summer, went out with them. Um, but the second um, second season around with that expedition, so I actually came to New York uh, to do my PhD in City University of New York and American Museum of Natural History. So, so it was um, um, in terms of you know, to describe how to become a paleontologist for short is this is how things happen. But, you know, being uh, becoming paleontologist in Mongolia is wasn't easy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Step for me, um, especially lack of sources for books. And um, even my uh, undergraduates, when I were majoring in geology, our textbooks were in Russian. So we didn't have textbooks that we can use for our own language to learn about the field. So, um, um, so now things are improving, you know, better because of internet. Uh, you get, you know, a lot of sources of information. Um, so, you know, I think uh, it's it's good information and source wise. Uh, you can get, um, you know, to know about paleontology. Um, but in terms of infrastructure um, for science, um, to have a lab and um, to having access to journals, scientific journals are also limited. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's there's a lot of improvement really needed to be done in Mongolia in terms of paleontology field. Yeah, so I mean, it sounds like you. In the in the UK and the US, everything is definitely set up so we can kind of make that progression with all the information available through through undergrad and into grad school. But it sounds like you had to spend a lot of time going out of your way to find out that information by yourself without help. Um, well, pretty much like that. I mean, um, like I'm talking about the time that I'm becoming a paleontologist, right? So of course now time is a little different. Um, So, you know, basically when I um, graduated, when I got my PhD, um, uh, you know, I knew, you know, how the environment and condition to be a scientist in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Even you went through these steps to become a paleontologist and then there's another step that you have to go through all obstacles in the country is a scientist. 
So that really bothered me um, that, okay, all these years I've been doing this research, then how that can be in the future if I go back to Mongolia. So that's why um, I really wanted, um, and also at the same time, I really got used to Western um, kind of system, how the research and science um you know, works here. So I really wanted that, you know, condition in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. And so that's why um, uh, I established this institute, um, non-profit institute, uh, Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs. So its main goal is really need to create for the next generation that they are welcome to go to this field with, you know, with support they need it um, like how you get, you know, um, the research supports, um, here in the States and UK. I mean, we do have a system like, um, we have Mongolian Academy of Sciences, uh, within that, um, means, um, that academy has multiple different institutes and, um, uh, research institutes, um, research centers. But I think we still need, you know, some change that how we should be doing science there. It's centrally controlled. Um, some way uh, for, it's for scientists to do uh, research, you know, some fields have lack of field, um, lab and access of books and also, um, you know, how is the current condition? It's really not welcoming um, young people to go, you know, interested to go to science. Um, yeah. And first of all, um, we really needed that science connect to the public, you know. Right. That, that is the part has been um, somewhere lacking in Mongolia and really needed. So that's why our institute is... Um, really focusing on public outreach to have public and kids to know about paleontology and geology, you know, natural science, you know. Um, uh, so the thing is we have the sources uh, in terms of fossils. We have a rich source of fossils, but, you know, most of those fossils are left out of country. Uh, for research purpose, some yeah. cases, and also being illegally exported. Um, so that's another thing that our institute also um, focusing that, you know, okay, so we are um, training next generation of Mongolian paleontologists, but in order to have them to do a research, they need to have a fossils, um, the specimens, but then to study those, they have to go to um, here in New York, go to mm -hmm. Holland, go to Russia, go to Japan, go to Korea. You know, I think you know, all fossils that left the country um, for temporary, um, they're supposed to come, come back to Mongolia for a certain period of time um, uh, after it's been studied, after being prepared. But um, because Mongolia doesn't have an infrastructure to handle all those fossils, and in addition to that, most importantly, we have a lack of uh, professional paleontologists. You know, it, it really, um, um, we um, slowing down the, the development of paleontology in Mongolia. So that's another thing is the institute really want to have a, you know, museum research um, you know, uh, based museum and of course education and research. Um, with that, we can have the you know next generation of paleontologists to have a you know really good research environment and condition that they can do the research. And at the same time, they can spread the knowledge through the exhibits and public programs and education and outreach. You know how things been practicing here in the U.S. and U.K. So. You know, that's really important. And yeah, yeah. Uh, considering 
90 years ago, Mongolian, first Mongolian dinosaurs and fossils being discovered by Rochef and Andrews from American Museum of Natural History. Since then, 90 years, you know, most of the public um, don't know about this discovery. Yeah. So that's, that's really, <clears throat> that really um, says a lot that, you know, um, there's so much of things we have to be doing in Mongolia to get the paleontology, you know, to, to develop better. So you've, I mean, yeah, obviously we're going to, I guess, talk a, a bit in a bit more detail about this later. You've been very instrumental in kind of setting up those links and yeah, really trying to inspire this next generation, uh, next generation of, of paleontologists in Mongolia. Um, I guess, you know, you've been talking a lot about um, this amazing fossil record in Mongolia and all these natural resources and, and and how little Mongolians know about it. Actually, probably not many people outside of Mongolia know a huge amount about the fossil record of Mongolia either. So if we could maybe spend a little bit of time talking about that and, you know, um, yeah, just, just what these amazing resources that you have available to you as a Mongolian paleontologist are. Well, in terms of geology, uh we do go back and well, in terms of fossil records, it's, uh, we, you know, to go back like Precambrian and, you know, we have, um, fossil records of, you know, basically almost, um, all geological time periods, you know, right. going to Paleozoic and Mesozoic and Cenozoic, um, time periods. And, um, of course, most of, uh, research and most of, um, interest has been, uh, focusing on uh, more for Mesozoic. Of course, for Paleozoic uh, period is important. There are, you know, some um, few Mongolian paleontologists working on Paleozoic um, fossil records. That's uh, like my father, he was um, studying um, fossil corals from um, like Artivision and uh, Silurian, Devonian times, you know, which is maybe, uh, which is about like uh, 400 million years ago. So of course, there are other invertebrates. We, we do have trilobites um, and Barazoians. So, um, but then uh, most of, um, you know, discoveries being um, made in also focused uh, periods of Mesozoic and Cenozoic. So specifically yeah. for Mesozoic, that late Cretaceous time period is, has been producing a lot of uh, rich fossil records. For, uh, um, so we have in the history that multiple um, uh, quite large expeditions came from Soviet Union, Poland, um, Japan, and Korea. So. The, the reason they focus on that time period is it's uh, not um, only um, rich, fo rich fossil records, but also fossils been preserved quite well. And, you know, all bones are intact because, you know, it's really important somewhere in paleontology if you have such, you know, well-preserved fossils and you get a lot of information uh, mm -hmm. out of that to learn so much about that um, specific uh, group of uh, animal. Um, so for dinosaurs, you know, most importantly is you know that um, uh, relationship between birds and dinosaurs, uh, origin of birds. Um, so that's a very um, compelling um, that, that Mongolia has very important discoveries to support um, that uh, bird and dinosaur relationships and um, there's one um, there are fossils like um, you know nesting of reactors so which shows like uh, bird behavior you know nesting on in its uh, nest and taking care of youngs and so um, and also in terms of mammals um, so uh, we do have um, uh, early mammal groups being found uh, in Mongolia starting from early Cretaceous about 125 million years ago to understanding um, the relationship of mammals that's been um, uh, discovered back then. Um, and they're all beautifully preserved 
in all three dimensional and it really yeah. helps to understand the phylogenetic relationships of those uh, groups. Um, and also for Cenozoic, um, there's a very important time period uh, that happened in Cenozoic in terms of, you know, globally um, that um, uh, Eocene, Oligocene boundary, that's about like 34, 34, 33, 34 million years ago was some uh, climate change um, event happened. Right, that was it was it was very hot at that point, right? And sort of might be an analog for what's going on now. Yeah, so basically, yeah, the during late A scene was warm and um, you know, quite uh, nice and tropical kind of climate. And then it uh, uh, changed to much cooler um, uh, uh, climate. Um, so that event's been recorded in Mongolia. And which is known as uh, <clears throat> Mongolian <clears throat> Mongolian remodeling, and at the same time there was faunal turnover. So it means that um, some mammals, uh, some you know groups of um, vertebrates, been extinct, and there's emerging of new um, group of um, mammals, and you know other vertebrates been coming out. So. And um, so this has happened globally because we know that from Mongolian record and also European, North American. And I think um, the European one is known as a Grand Cooper um, yeah. uh, event. Um, so that's also been recorded, not only terrestrial, I think it's also for marine mm -hmm. um, environment had also some uh, final turnover happened. So, so I think, um, so that sense, you know, Mongolia has uh, fossil records that is very important. And then um, I didn't mention actually in uh, Cambrian time in Mongolia, we do have a record of, um, um, you know, having uh, early evolution of mollusk shell. Okay. Um, so, which is also, uh, you know, important and interesting. So it um, really sounds like a, almost the whole of, of the uh, history of life is recorded somewhere in Mongolia. And you also have these amazing fossils from sort of periods of transition, you know, the origin of birds, the origin of mammals, origin of mollusks. Um, there's a lot going on in Mongolia. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, we have so much uh, in terms of paleontology, um, you know, if we have more younger generation come in, there's, you know, no shortage of things and interesting questions and um, fossils to study in Mongolia. I mean, it's still going on with uh, collaboration with uh, foreign scientists. I would say, I think it's possible a lot of our listeners might not know a lot about Mongolia as a country or the Gobi Desert, which I believe is where you do some of your field work. Could you just describe to us kind of what the landscape is like in different parts of the country and, and what you might expect to see if you if you go out in the field in Mongolia? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, Mongolia, um, it's not just only the Gobi Desert. <laughs> it's the Obviously. landscape, how it looks. And so it's actually quite large um, country. Um, it's almost, uh, you know, I, I could be in terms of size could be wrong, but it, it's almost close to the size of like um, Alaska. Um, I mean, if we put the Mongolian map on the Europe, it will be multiple countries will fit into Mongolian yeah. territory. So um, the capital city is called Ulaanbaatar. And then if you go to uh, Northern Mongolia, we have a, a Southern, uh, Southern tip of um, Siberian forest actually do go into Mongolian territory. Um, then if you go to Western Mongolia, we have um, mountain ranges like Altai Mountain. It's a quite big mountain range that, uh, range that stretches from west to east, even, you know, some reaches, you know, all the way to um, uh, Gobi Desert. So, uh, if you look at the map of Mongolia in the southern 
part that basically wrap a little bit to east and west, that's the Gobi Desert. And that's where's the most of um, those uh, dinosaurs and other vertebrates been known. And of course, other um, you know, invertebrates and in paleontology, in terms of fossils, those are areas, the most rich. Um, then if you go to east is basically quite um, low hills and steps. And we have like um, uh, herds of uh, gazelles running across the field, very often nice field. Um, so it's a um, it's combination of many different landscapes that, you know, it, it's beautiful. Naturally, it's a very beautiful place. You were quite famously instrumental in the case of Tarbosaurus batar, which is a dinosaur from the Gobi Desert that had actually been illegally transported to the United States for sale and that had gone via the UK. Can you tell us a bit about that and what happened, how the Mongolian people got their dinosaur fossil back? Um, well, uh, before I talk about the dinosaur, I have to be uh, very clear about, you know, in terms of fossils, uh, leaving the country. Mm. So um, um, what's happening is, you know, historically Mongolia had these different um, exp- scientific expeditions been working in Mongolia, and each, you know, of those expeditions had collected fossils, and those fossils left the country for research purpose. Yeah. And, and then, you know, for some period of time, uh, it's been loaned to different institutions abroad. Um, so another way, um, you know, how fossils has been left the country is illegally exported out of country. And so that's the one of the uh, <clears throat> issue and problem that when, when I was establishing our institute, we really wanted to focus on that because that problem has been hanging a long time, um, basically starting um, uh, early 90s. So, um, so at the same time, we want to do conservation. You know, conservation, when you think of conservation, when we say conservation, people think of, oh, conservation of living animals, right? But yeah. conservation for fossils is very important um, equally. So... Um, in terms of Tarbosaurus Batar, um, you know, case, that happened this 2012. But, you know, in terms of how, you know, fossils been living illegally, been known among um, paleontologists, it's not just, you know, I knew it, it's actually every, you know, paleontologist knew this issue and problems. And at the same time, um, I've been trying to get the government attention on this issue. It's, it's uh, way before Tibet, uh, Tarbosaur Batar case. And reaching out to, um, you know, uh, politicians, parliament members, and the point is, hey, we have this really important um, fossil heritage that's been stolen and illegally taken out of country. It's been um, sold to auction houses. And it's been sold to some, you know, shops, rocks and mineral shops. And so we have to get our attention on this problem. We have to, you know, stop this. And um, we're losing our heritage out, you know, for science, we're losing our knowledge. So um, so when that 2012, when Tarbosaurus Batar was going to be auctioned here in New York City in heritage auctions, uh, three days before that auction, um, I accidentally found out, you know, I based in New York, um, I was traveling and I just came to the city and then I saw this uh, local news um, is, you know, reporting that um, this amazing and beautiful, nearly complete dinosaur from Central Asia is, was going to be auctioned in heritage auctions on May 20th. So I found out on May 17th, three days before. So, um, you know, I, I had kind of feeling that possibly, you know, from Mongolia. And so it was uh, from Mongolia, but heritage auctions actually put the provenance as Central Asia. 
So when I looked at the image, so I right away I knew that was uh, from Mongolia. So I sent actually email to Mark Norell at the American Museum of Natural History mm-hmm. and uh, asked him if he aware of this option. And, and also at the same time, you know, uh, to, to get also his you know, opinion on, do you think this is also from Mongolia? So that's how things were started. And at the same time, I actually sent email to one of president's, uh, Mongolian president's advisor, and whom I actually been in contact some years that trying to um, introduce to her, you know, all this paleontology, uh, uh, paleontological fossil, you know, issues we've been facing in the country that we really need to pay, you know, country and government has to, you know, do and change things. Um, so she, you know, because she's been informed, because she's been, um, you know, given, you know, these years of information I gave to her, she right away went to Mongolian president to um, um, tell him about the auction. So president actually, um, you know, came in and basically he did actually uh, made public announcement about this auction um, and asking to hold off the auction till the provenance of the dinosaur uh, being, uh, was um, determined. So, so you'd kind of been working on, you'd certainly been working on trying to you know, prevent this happening for a long time, but it, it just happened. There was quite a high profile case. And then, and then the president of Mongolia became involved. Yeah. So, I mean, that was the thing because that dinosaur was going to be auctioned for million dollars. I mean, could right. be millions. So, um, so that's why, you know, some way, um, this kind of case really gets people's attention. I mean, mm-hmm. before then, there were fossils being I've seen on catalogs of, you know, different auction houses, and you know, you know, I think, but this case was some way is uh, really caught the eyes, and um, uh, yeah, so these things were happening uh, within the three days, so it really. Uh, you know, helped uh, that when the government jumped in, when president's office jumped on this, you know, auction in um, to stop, prevent to, you know, to auction this dinosaur. So we really worked uh, very hard for three days. Um, and and we, we hired a U.S. Uh, lawyer uh, from Texas and he was able to get the temporary restraining order even with that, auction actually uh, uh, proceeded. Um, so it was kind of, you know, um, up and down, up and down, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was an easy case. But then, and then in, within a year, we were able to get back the dinosaur in, on the anniversary that I was sending email to the president. That's the day we actually uh, had the dinosaur to fly to Mongolia. So I was going okay. all these um, cases and event. I've been very closely involved. And then um, when Dinosaur came to Mongolia, it was sensational. It was, you know, almost everybody in Mongolia wanted to see this, you know, dinosaur. What is, you know, this dinosaur has been on the news so much. And, you know, so, and the story was also very uh, exciting and interesting uh, way it happened. So in the same time, it really brought awareness to public that, you know, oh, we have this such an important heritage. Of course, you know, there is some um, money uh, price tag on this dinosaur also caught people's eyes, right? Million dollar is the bond can be cost million dollar, you know, I mean, fossils. And so in, in, with with different kind of curiosity, people came to see these dinosaurs. I have to um, do the exhibit on, you know, when we brought it, that, you know, sent it to Mongolia, I flew right after dinosaur and helped to build the exhibit on that dinosaur. And the first day of uh, the opening of the exhibit, um, I was doing myself also a couple of times I've been, you know, doing a, guiding the people 
telling yeah. them the story, what happened here in the States to stop the auction and how that dinosaur came to Mongolia. So um, everybody was fascinated about it. I never had such a reaction um, from public in Mongolia that day because even before that, uh, we've been doing outreach project in Mongolia. It was really hard to get people's you know, interest to you know, to know about dinosaurs. Yeah. You know, I have to go after people, but when Tarposaurus Batar came back to Mongolia, people came uh, to me to asking questions about the dinosaur. And then they were saying like, how we can stop this, how we can deal with this illegally dinosaur taken out of country. You know, each person almost have opinion. You yeah, know, it sounds like it's been really had a really positive effect on people's interest. It, 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 yeah, um, there's a lot of positive effect, but I think um, also um, the thing I concern also negative effect can bring in. You mm. know, again, this dinosaur has a price tag on it, and so so that's why um, you know, right? You know, in this event, the same time happening. We're doing the outreach project more often so that um, people see the value with different eyes, not with the money. So that's it for part one, but don't forget to listen to part two, which is available now. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary. It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news.